Hello everyone, I'm Kate Jones and this is my Brew Ed Clee presentation take two. So this is not live. Uh, I really enjoyed presenting live and there was question and answers. It was meant to be recorded but there was a few technical issues. So I thought I'd re-record it because a lot of people on Twitter said they wanted to see it and they asked me and I really enjoyed this presentation so I hope you find it useful. The theme of the presentation is teaching and learning takeaways. Um, takeaways as in some practical ideas you can take away and implement in the classroom, but also things that you can take away and think about and reflect on. So a little bit about me, um, I'm head of history at a wonderful school in Abu Dhabi, um, but I did teach in the UK for six years. I've also authored two books. I've got some more books on the way, which is very exciting. And uh, I have a podcast, I'm quite active on social media. I've got a teaching and learning website, love to teach 87com So please do check that out and please do connect with me online. So to start off with, uh, this is my most recent book, Retrieval Practice, and I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I will touch upon Retrieval Practice. And one of the main messages that um, I wanted to, people to take away from retrieval practice, I wanted it to help them, but this idea of myth busting, um, there's quite a lot of myths around retrieval practice from opponents of, of this strategy, um, that it promotes rote learning and pub quiz uh, recall. And actually it's so effective, it's so powerful, that we really should be using it in schools and most schools are embracing it and rightly so. So for anyone who perhaps doesn't have that appreciation for retrieval practice, maybe it would be um, worth um, finding out a little bit more about it. So a mantra that I have is low effort and high impact. And I've put um, a screenshot of edu teacher tips because there's a video of me talking about this. Uh, and this is a great YouTube channel. Um, lots of teachers and leaders share two minute videos where they offer advice for teachers and leaders. And this was created by Sarah Mullin. She's an author. She does lots online. She's fantastic. So do check out Edu Teacher Tips. So coming back to low effort, high impact. The low effort refers to the amount of effort that the teacher puts into task design because I know I've been very guilty of putting far too much time, effort and energy into creating classroom resources. A task design is important, but when we think about cutting and gluing and laminating, those things are not a good use of our time. But when it comes to retrieval practice, one of the reasons why it's so good is because it can be low effort, doesn't require much preparation from the teacher, but it will have a high impact on student learning. So again, that's my mantra, low effort, high impact. When it comes to task design, that should come second to question design. And we really need to think more carefully uh, about the questions that we're asking. So this is something that I'm really interested in and I've looked into a lot. Multiple choice versus free recall, open-ended questions. And I wanted to find out which was the better strategy. And there's lots of research uh, on both of these techniques. And the conclusion that I came up with based on um, the research I'd read and the advice from cognitive scientists was that we should combine both. We shouldn't just limit retrieval to multiple choice every lesson, but we shouldn't just use free recall. Now, multiple choice, many might regard that as not as effective because potentially you could be recognizing an answer rather than actually retrieving it, recalling it. But a way to avoid that is through clever question design. Multiple choice is great because it might address some misconceptions and also it's more likely um, to give students some, some retrieval success, which is what they do need in addition to retrieval challenge. And also there is research that suggests that younger students need more support with retrieval practice. So multiple choice questions are great for them. Now free recall, where the, probably the most famous activity is a, a brain dump. So in history, I might say, write down everything you can remember about the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Now that has required minimal planning for me, low effort, 
but it's hard. The students don't have much support or prompts. It requires a lot of effort. And that's what makes it more effective in terms of retrieval practice than multiple choice questions. And we can make it um, more challenging. So it's about this balance between retrieval success and re retrieval challenge and about mixing it up, providing opportunities for both. And what I really like about online quizzing tools such as Google Forms and quizzes is you can actually combine both of these style questions. You can create a quiz that will have some multiple choice and that will have some free recall or you could just do one or the other. So it's just important that we use both. And I've included this infographic by Blake Harvard, and that's his Twitter handle. He's um, an American educator. He's a teacher of psychology. He's a wonderful blogger. He's absolutely incredible. And he does have a book coming out soon, which is very exciting. And he has written a lot about multiple choice questions and the different techniques and strategies that we could use with them. So if you are interested in finding out more, but multiple choice question design, I highly recommend reading the work of Blake. He's also actually delivered a Brew Ed Clee presentation. Uh, so yeah, he's just wonderful. So again, um, I mentioned about a brain dump, uh, although Teacher Toolkit's template actually says Brian dump, but I'm pretty sure he means brain. <laughs> um, and we can just simply have a template like this. Um, and there is a little bit more support and guidance for those younger students or it can be open your books and on, all you need is a pen and paper. Or if you're doing it digitally, it's just really simple, really powerful, really effective. So how much support should we give? I've said we should give younger students some support. We know that students with uh, learning difficulties will require support. There's been research carried out in 2020 about um, ADHD students and basically should we use retrieval practice with them? The report is really interesting. Yes, we should use retrieval practice. It's a great strategy, all ages, genders and ability, but there are students who need some support. So I'll give you a, an example that I talk about quite a lot. I used to put this uh, a portrait on the board for my key stage three class about Henry VIII. And I would say, write down everything you can remember about Henry VIII. And this would be after a few lessons uh, where we've been studying the reign of Henry VIII. And I was always so disappointed with the answers, not everyone, but just generally. And the reason for that being there was a few, a few errors the, and mistakes that I made as a teacher. So what some students would do, would they would describe that portrait rather than actually recall from memory what they can about Henry VIII. So I remember walking around the class and the first thing students would be writing was Henry VIII was fat uh, and they would write about the type of clothes he wore, basically just from looking at, at the image on the screen. And then some of the other facts that students were recalling were very basic. Uh, Henry VIII had six wives and this frustrated me because we had explored so much more in lessons. We'd looked at the break with Rome, the dissolution of the monasteries. They weren't writing about that. But actually, I take some responsibility because I never asked them to. I just gave very vague general instructions. What can you recall about Henry VIII? So as I was about to teach, this was last academic year, and I got to this point um, in my lesson planning where I was about to ask this question. I thought, I'm not, I'm not doing this because I know what's going to happen. I can predict it. So that's what made me come up with the idea of a picture prompt. So this is still free recall. Students have to write from memory, but there's a prompt and there's some guidance with the icon. Uh, and here we're obviously using dual coding, combining images and text. And they had to explain how each icon was linked to Henry VIII using their memory. So we've got the crown, we've got the wedding ring, we've got the Pope and money, uh, all of these things that they can write about and they did write about and their answers were so much better than what previous years had done because they'd had more support and specific guidance. I also teach the Tudors at A level and if I were to start a lesson and ask students to fill the page, write down everything you can remember about Henry VIII, they would be able to do this without the support and they would write 
more relevant detailed information they are capable of doing that they wouldn't need the picture prompt i wouldn't use that with that class so it is all about putting retrieval practice into context of our own classes now this you may have seen before it's been very popular on twitter the most popular one of my resources over a hundred thousand downloads and i think it's so popular because it combines retrieval and space practice and it's a very simple strategy it's not perfect if you want to use it at the start of a lesson to to do that activity justice it will probably take you too long what you could do is you could just use perhaps four of the questions or six you you can alter it and adapt it um, and it does require teacher input for feedback and reflection you will need to talk through the answers rather than just sticking them on the board which is a mistake that i previously made so again it's it is popular but it's not perfect and lots of teachers have adapted it in their subject so the idea of this is that it's a points based but that's low stakes to make it no stakes you could just remove the points and the questions are based on when uh, the material was covered last lesson last week two weeks ago further back so we can actually use interleaving here we could use space practice and retrieval practice the simple strategies are always the best ones as well so my favorite online quizzing tool is quizzes and i'm not a quiz as quizzes <laughs> sorry how to say quizzes ambassador i'm not an ade or anything like that um but i do i am interested in using technology and for me this tool stands out above all the others. Kahoot has improved and changed its functions. Google Forms is great. And my school is a Google school. We have Google Chromebooks, but I just love quizzes. And I very recently published a blog post explaining why I think it's so brilliant. And I'm referring to the free option as well. You can upgrade and there are more features, but and they are really good actually, because um, a teacher who was using the upgraded uh, super version showed me about the flashcards and things like that. I thought, oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> so, but the free version is also more than enough. Um, so do check out quizzes. Now, I wanted to include this placemat. Again, low effort, you can just put it on the board, you don't even need to print it out, and encourage students to talk in pairs, answering these questions, retrieving information from previous lessons. This is really low effort and high impact. And I mentioned about mixing it up between multiple choice and free recall. Well, actually we should mix it up between written retrieval and verbal retrieval. There are some students who respond really well to verbal retrieval. They can recall information quicker and with ease because actually one of the factors could be that they struggle with their writing and their literacy skills and that is the issue, not necessarily the recall. So if they have opportunities for verbal uh, retrieval, then that can also boost their confidence uh, about their knowledge and about their ability to retrieve information. So linking onto this is the work from Barry Smith. And I think Barry is brilliant. Um, he is on Twitter there, you can follow him and you should follow him. He's very experienced. Um, worked at Michaela, he's been a head teacher, and he, he has very strong opinions, but actually they are rooted in effective teaching strategies from his own experiences. And I have seen a video of him teaching, and he's just a remarkable teacher. He's just wonderful. So one of the things that he gets teachers to do, uh, sorry, students to do is shape their answers. And he, I, I love this. You might have heard of slant and uh, other acronyms, but shape. So what is it? So students uh, have to answer in full sentences, no single word answers. So this is about elaboration and extending that answer. Hand away from the mouth. Mm, this is about trying to increase their confidence verbally. This is probably something we don't talk about enough in schools is about um, oral communication. I run an extracurricular club called Talk Like Ted, which is about promoting public speaking skills. And the club is aimed at people who enjoy public speaking and want to improve. But also if public speaking terrifies you, you should come to this club and we can help you overcome your nerves. Also then we've got articulate, don't mumble, be very clear. 
clear, loud voice, project it so everyone at the back can hear as well. And then eye contact. And I've spoke to Barry about this and he does realise that obviously some people will say it's very difficult for some students to maintain eye contact. And we do appreciate that context is key. But if a student can answer a question that uh, and the answer is shaped, so it's a, in full sentences, it's confident, it's loud and clear uh, with eye contact, this is, this is really a, a strong skill. This is really something we should develop in our children. So I'm all for shaping our answers. Barry. <laughs> this is an example of a task that could be retrieval, or you could do it at another point uh, where you're actually working on vocabulary instruction. This is something that I created called Keyword Spotlight. So the keyword in the spotlight there is democracy. Students have to define it from memory in their own words, use it correctly in a sentence to show they can put it in context. Democracy is the answer. What is the question? We've got a little bit of the dual coding here. Can you, um, and I really like that, that illustration there. I think it, it really sums up democracy well. And then what are the keywords are connected to it? I think that's a great example. And then at the bottom, student self-assess. Now, from my experience, I've never seen a student colour in not yet, because if they manage to answer those on the sheet, then they've obviously got some level of confidence. But sometimes they will colour in almost, and that could either be linked to their confidence or their understanding or their ability to recall. But most of the time, if they've been able to recall and complete all of the activities, then they're, they're very confident. So retrieval practice works really well with developing and, and checking vocabulary understanding. So I share this a lot. I'm really proud of this infographic, my teaching and learning jigsaw puzzle. And there's more to education than retrieval practice. People probably think, Kate, you're always banging on about retrieval practice. Yes, I am because I'm so passionate about it, because it's such an effective strategy, but I'm well aware that there's a lot more to education than retrieval practice. And the reason I created it as a jigsaw was because all of these factors are connected. Retrieval practice will be more effective um, when combined with challenging questions as part of a knowledge rich curriculum. Retrieval practice will be more effective when it's spaced out. Retrieval practice requires feedback and reflection. So they're all connected, they're all important, but they're all one piece of a complex puzzle when it comes to teaching and learning. This is also very similar, um, showing retrieval practice is important, but it's just one component. This is something um, I created when I was reflecting on um, a few years ago, I had a, a cohort, their results were absolutely incredible. And I remember my colleagues were saying about the results, what's your secret? And um, that's what we tend to do is ask the teacher when actually really it, it was, <laughs> it, well, I, perhaps we could say combined effort because I put in a huge amount of effort and my students put a huge amount of effort in. So it's not my secret. And I said, it, it's no secret. I use retrieval practice for two years with this class. We spaced it out. Their effort was incredible. They had support from me, from, from their parents. And generally this class of attendance was very good. So they had success, but if we remove any of those factors, it will have an impact, negative impact on their success. We know how damaging attendance can be. Attendance is a really difficult factor for lots of schools. And if attendance is really low, they will have gaps in their knowledge. It can lead to lower results. If students don't have a good support network around them both in and outside of school they can become very anxious and we know that anxiety and stress can um, have a negative impact on focus and memory as well as general well-being but if students don't put the effort in because we can do all the things that we can as teachers retrieval practice space practice but they have to put the effort in. They do have to take responsibility for their learning. And if they don't put the effort in, they probably won't reach their potential and they will underperform. If they don't space out their practice, they will cram. If they don't use retrieval practice, they will use ineffective strategies such as highlighting, rereading, underlining, all the things that Dunlosky rated uh, as low utility. So we don't want them to use that, those strategies. Okay then, so the next one, um, I tweeted this, you might know what the answer is. 
Um, this is a definition, someone who is very interested in a particular subject and knows a lot about it. Would you say that is you? And actually don't be modest here. I am very interested in the subject of history. And um, that's my subject, that's my degree. I'd like to think I know a lot about it. Oh, well, I do, this, but obviously I can learn more. In regards to teaching, I'm very interested in it. I like to think again, I know a lot about it, but I recognize I could learn more. So yes, I'm someone who's very interested in a particular subject and I consider myself to know a lot about it. So that makes me a geek. Yes, it does. And I fully embrace that. Um, I haven't always embraced it, but we need to embrace our teacher geek. There's so many teachers who love watching webinars and attending events and reading books and their colleagues or their friends might roll their eyes or call them sad or tell them to get a life. I've heard this plenty of times. I traveled on weekends to go to conferences and I remember Oh, perhaps 2014, when there were no teach meets in the area, I travelled from North Wales to Reading. Um, I just, I, I went, my first teach meet was Teach Meet London. So <laughs> they weren't on my doorstep, but I really enjoyed it. And I, I learned so much. I met amazing people. But then there were comments from people I worked with that said, oh, have you got nothing better to do on a weekend? Do you have no other life? And actually, that's not true. And it was really hurtful. So it's taken me a few years, but I totally embrace my teacher geek. And I love Twitter because I'm surrounded by other teacher geeks. So my question to you now is, do you love to teach? And just think about this carefully. If your answer is yes, amazing. And just try and think, why is it you love to teach? because we often need reminders of that, especially this year. It's been so challenging and difficult and teaching has been not normal or the, the new normal. So what is it you love about teaching? Remind yourself of that. If your answer to this, do you love to teach is no, then you need to reflect and ask why. And I remember, and this is when I was actually writing the book, Love to Teach. And I felt really sad. I thought, I don't know if I love to teach anymore. And I'm, I'm writing a book called Love to Teach. And the more I thought about it, I realized, no, I actually do love being in the classroom and teaching. It was what was happening around me in the school culture that I was not happy with. Um, I, and I, I left that school, um, but it did make me question um, and it did have a, a, an impact on my practice and my general well-being. If your answer is, no, I don't, I don't love to teach, but I like it. Well, that's OK as well, of course. You know, we all have different definitions. I've just used love to teach <laughs> as a general phrase. But my, my point is, are you happy being there? Are you a teacher who wants to be there? Because I do genuinely believe that every child deserves a teacher who wants to teach them, who wants them to do well. So my next question to you is what do all great teachers have in common? Now there's probably quite a lot of answers to this, but this for me is the main thing. And the fact that you're watching this presentation shows that you are great. <laughs> you never want to stop learning. And there are teachers who, who feel that they, they don't need to carry on in regards to professional development. Um, and I can recall a colleague, uh, I don't, not in my current school. And I'd read Making Every Lesson Count and by Sean Allison and Andy Tharby, and the book was amazing. And I said to a colleague, I think you'd really like this. And he's like, Kate, I'll just stop you there. My results are amazing. I've been a teacher for X amount of years. My lesson observations are outstanding. I don't need to read any of your books. And I was stunned. And I remember thinking, wow. I, I hope I never, ever have that attitude. And that has stuck with me. Uh, I, I never want to be like that. I want to continually learn. And the school I'm at now, in the interview, one of the questions was, why, you know, why do you want to work here? And there were lots of reasons, but I would probably say this is the main reason, that their reputation for professional learning, they tripled their CPD budget, um, I followed teachers and leaders from the school on Twitter. I saw the things they were doing. I just knew that professional learning was a real priority at that school. And I haven't been disappointed. 
it's been incredible. And I felt that that could be a school that I could flourish in. So next question, what do great schools have in common? And this links in with what I've just said, they never stop improving. So there were some schools um, and it, that I recall a conversation with a head teacher who was chatting to me at an event and he said, we're outstanding. And I told my staff, don't worry, just, just keep doing what you're doing. And I think that message is great. Don't, don't do anything different for an inspection. But he said, no, 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 we don't need to improve. We've got outstanding. That's it now. Said, well, a school can always improve. An outstanding label shouldn't stop professional learning and reflection and development. But a school will never stop improving it, if, it, if it has teachers who never stop learning and a teacher who never wants to stop learning will develop a, a much better pace at a school that never stops improving so we need to have both of these things individual teachers who want to keep learning and schools who want to keep improving both so important so if we want to keep learning, how do we do that? How do we get better at getting better? I created another jigsaw because they're all connected. First point, learn from others. This could be a conversation with a colleague. It can be going into another lesson. It could be something like this, a webinar, a presentation. It could be a book that you are reading, written by someone in education. There are so many ways. And actually that tends to be a low effort, low cost strategy that we probably should all take more advantage of. Then we have research that is incredibly important and useful. We shouldn't ignore it, we shouldn't neglect it. I'm so happy there's been this research ed movement in recent years. Research has changed my practice and the approach we should take is research informed rather than research led because we also need to consider classroom and teacher experience in addition to research. And all of those things require reflection. Uh, that's so important. And what I want to ask you now is how often do you reflect on your practice? And I ask that because this was something I did not do for the first few years of my career. I remember as an NQT, I had a year nine class, I think Wednesday afternoon, double lesson, and it was just so difficult behavior wise and every lesson just felt like a disaster and at the end of the lesson I'd be very stressed I think right just forget about it I don't see them again until next week I'll deal with it then it was totally the wrong attitude to have what I should have done is I should have reflected on my practice was anything going well in the lesson what where at what point was it going wrong perhaps it was the seating plan maybe I could also talk to colleagues someone who teaches this class, ask if they have the same issues or problems or what solutions they have. But that just kept, that was ongoing. Um, I had difficulties with that class for a long time because two reasons, I didn't reflect and I didn't ask for support. So now I'm gonna share some suggestions and I've got three as a magic number. There were so many, I could share 10 books, 10 blogs, but I'm gonna to stick to three, which is very difficult. So three brilliant books. We've got Education Exposed, and actually Sam Strickland's written another book, Education Exposed 2, which is out very soon. I haven't read it, but if it's anything like his first book, it will be incredible. I've read this a few times, actually, and each time I've read it, it's just, I just think, wow, this is, it is more than common sense. It, it is very reflective. It's very honest. Um, it's just a great book for teachers and leaders. Patrice Bain also delivered a Brewhead Clee presentation. She's a teacher in America and she's co-authored the book with cognitive scientist, creator of retrievalpractice.org, Dr. Pooja Agarwal. That's a really enjoyable book combining the research and the resources. And then finally, this is my favorite book about education, hands down, uh, Bradley Bushkin, and Ed Watson, The Science of Learning. This does cover retrieval practice memory, but it covers so much more. It covers sleep, it covers research about mobile phones and listening to music and about motivation. It's, it's just a book I keep referring to. I've shared with colleagues, I've said heads of year should read it, form tutors, teachers, head teachers, everyone should read that book. It's, it's just, it's really, really good.
Right, three brilliant blogs. First of all, Tom Sherrington, he's a fantastic writer, both books and blogs, and his blogs are of such a high quality. Now, Dawn Cox, she's a teacher of RE, but actually, I did teach RE, I don't anymore. I still find her blogs incredibly helpful. They make me reflect on my own practice. Just wonderful. She's a classroom teacher um, and her, her blogs just will resonate with you. And also another beautiful writer, Claire Stone. And one of her blogs actually made me cry. That's only ever happened once. Um, it, she's just, it's very thought provoking. Uh, she has a book coming out, um, I think probably next year, which I'm really looking forward to. So three fantastic bloggers there. And I love that there's been a, an interest in, in podcasts in the last few years. And there's, there's so many podcasts to choose from. Naylor's Natter, Phil Naylor, I've been on there twice. He chats to lots of different people in education. And he's just a lovely guy um, and really enjoyable to listen to. I really like Page to Practice because they review different educational books. Um, if you have read a book, then it's quite interesting to hear what other people's reflections are. Uh, if you're thinking about reading a book, then that's really good as well. You can listen to that and think if that's the book for you. You can also contribute to, to this. So Bex will put out on Twitter, we're reviewing this book. If you'd like to send me a, an audio to include on the podcast, then please do so. Uh, and then Darren Leslie is doing some great work, especially in Scotland, but he's interviewed um, lots of different well-known authors and educators, and that's definitely a podcast, Becoming Educated, that you should check out. So finally, um, three types of social media. Twitter, obviously I use that a lot, hashtag Guru Ed Klee. Uh, it, it's a great source of networking, learning and sharing. I use Instagram, I have two Instagram, my personal Abu Dhabi food pics, which probably are quite boring uh, to a lot of people. And then I have my teacher account, my love to teach 87. And there's a completely different audience on Instagram. I've connected with a lot of American educators but you're not limited by the character count. Uh, it's really good. Check out Instagram, the teacher community. And then finally, LinkedIn. Lots of teachers internationally use this. Uh, I actually got my second job through LinkedIn because I put on LinkedIn, I was looking for a history position in the United Arab Emirates and a head teacher contacted me. And then that led to an interview and that led to me securing the job. But even if you don't want to look for a new job, LinkedIn's great for articles and connecting with people and so on. So my last point, and actually, this is so important right now. When you are on a plane, which <laughs> I haven't been on a plane for a while, that's been quite difficult. But when you are on a plane, when it comes to the oxygen mask, what do they tell you to do? They tell you to put your own on first before fitting a child's oxygen mask. And I know that probably sounds to, to somebody, I don't want to do that, it sounds selfish. But the truth is you have to do that. And that's what we need to do as teachers. We need to look after our health, mental and physical. And this has happened to me where I've put my health last. I will stay up late and reduce the amount of sleep because I've had a lot of work to do. I haven't gone to the gym because I've chosen to do the marking that I felt had to be done. So we need to just get to that point with the balance in our lives where we don't feel guilty for putting ourselves first. So yeah, thank you very much. If you have any feedback, if you'd like to get in touch with me, then please do so. And I hope you found this presentation useful.